Welcome to Whistle Where You Work. I'm Mark Cohen. Bogdan Djokovic used to run undercover tests on airline security for the FAA, but when he breached airport security 90% of the time, he was rewarded with a clerk's job and shunned by the powers that be. We'll chat with Bogdan Djokovic in just a few minutes, but first, should national security agents be protected against reprisals for reporting waste, fraud, or abuse to Congress? The Bush administration says no. Danielle Bryan of the Project on Government Oversight takes a very different view. Is the government concealing too much information through its document classification system? Again, the Bush administration says no. But Meredith Fuchs of the National Security Archive begs to differ. Welcome, Meredith and Danielle, to Whistle Where You Work. Thank you. Danielle, um, we live in a sometimes very dangerous and complex world. Uh, and there are a lot of risks, uh, including terrorism. And we have agencies that are devoted to dealing with this. Sometimes those agencies uh, go beyond uh, the law. And in those circumstances, for instance, when the NSA engages in warrantless wiretapping or when the CIA trains people uh, to torture uh, suspected terrorism detainees. A, an agent of conscience who wants to come forward and say, this is wrong, where can they go and can they do something about it? I think this is one of the biggest problems we're facing in the current whistleblower community is the fact that there's nowhere for those people to go. There's the assumption uh, that there are all these opportunities, for example, to go to the inspector general. But when you find in reality that very rarely do the inspector generals in the intelligence community um, expect to relate to or work with whistleblowers. What, what is an inspector general? That's a great question. Uh, the Congress in 1976 created the whistleblower, uh, I'm sorry, the Inspector General Act, creating essentially an inside watchdog who is supposed to both work by uh, investigating waste, fraud, and abuse and reporting to the head of the agency as well as reporting to the Congress. And the Congress thinks that, that the inspector generals are really the people that uh, are supposed to handle whistleblower intake. But the IGs we're learning in our investigations actually don't think that at all. And they're expecting whistleblowers to go to the Congress. And then what we find is who in Congress is supposed to actually receive information from the kind of national security whistleblower you're talking about, someone who's at one of the intelligence agencies who has classified information. They may want to speak to their senator from the state where they live, but that senator may not have not be on the right committee. And so if they were to go to speak to that Senate office and provide classified information, the Bush administration thinks that that should not be a protected disclosure. Currently, are there any protections for going for, uh, to Congress? No, isn't that really extraordinary? There are, on paper, protections. There's the Lloyd LaFollette Act, which says that any citizen can uh, petition their member of Congress. But that act really doesn't do any good when there's no protections when you uh, utilize that right and you're retaliated because of it. All right, let's talk a little bit more about whether the inspector general, now that law for the inspector generals was just reformed, wasn't it, by Congress? Yes, and, it was. And gave the inspector generals, more, inspectors general, yes. uh, uh, more power, uh, more independence. So can't whistleblowers now rely on it more than they have in the past? Well, there really uh, was no articulation of the role of whistleblowers in working with the inspectors general in, in that act. Uh, and another thing that's important to recognize is many of those intelligence agencies that we're talking about, uh, those IGs are actually not even the statutory IGs often that are uh, created by the Congress. Many of them are military IGs that work through the chain of command. Uh, so when you're a military officer with, with classified information and you go to your IG, that may not be an IG who actually also reports to the Congress. But how would that poor whistleblower know that? So this person who wants to make the disclosure, 
given what you know about the system that they face, would you tell them that they should go ahead and do it anyways? I could not in good conscience tell an intelligence national security whistleblower to publicly uh, go forward. Meaning, I'm, I'm not even saying publicly like going to the media. I'm talking about um, uh, going directly to a congressional office because uh, there really aren't protections for them. And so as a result of that, you end up having what become anonymous leaks to the media. So ironically, the theory behind keeping the classified information that intelligence uh, whistleblowers know secret is actually ultimately forcing it out into the public. Uh, we have another situation like that, Meredith, with the classification of documents at the federal level as well, don't we, where there is an issue. Uh, obviously, we need to classify some documents because some secrets are really necessary to maintain the safety of the American public. Where do you draw the line between what should be classifiable and what should be available for the free flow of discussion and to make democracy work? Well, the problems that Danielle talked about are very much compounded by excessive overclassification. I mean, when you have Donald Rumsfeld, when he's Secretary of State, saying we have overclassification, and people like Porter Goss, who was the director of the CIA, saying there's overclassification, um, we have every reason to believe it's true. And the problem is that when you start classifying information, you're inhibiting discussion of it, you're inhibiting sharing it. The whistleblowers get stuck in a, in a hard position because there's all these things that are said to be secret. They're not allowed to talk about them. They may or may not legitimately be secret, um, but there's nothing they can do. Um, it, it interferes with information sharing between the agencies, and it makes it very hard to have policy discussions that we need to have. But it is a dangerous world, and there is the danger of revealing secrets that could uh, result in mass destruction. Uh, how do we ensure that, it, aren't we better off by erring on the side of too much classification to, in order to make us more secure? Not at all. In fact, that's part of what leaves us vulnerable. In fact, the 9-11 Commission found one of its principal findings was that the failure to share information caused largely because of classification and territoriality between agencies is what left us vulnerable to attack. So it doesn't make us share uh, as safer to classify. The question is, how do we classify real secrets and let the rest of the stuff flow freely? Well, one thing is, you know, costs over $7 billion a year to manage our classification system. And that doesn't include classification at the CIA. That's every other agency, because the CIA budget's classified. And if we're going to spend $7 billion, we should be spending it on the real secrets. And we shouldn't be wasting our time on things like the fact that the NSA has a memo saying that Santa Claus was flying around the country, which they do. <laughs> and we got it declassified <laughs> ultimately <laughs> under the Freedom of Information Act. But you know, we shouldn't be wasting our time on those things. Let's train people better. Let's have internal audits at agencies to look at whether they're classifying properly. When people are improperly classifying information to protect against embarrassment, Let's make sure that there are protections for reporting the improper classification, whistleblower protections within the agencies. Let's put some pressure against the bureaucratic tendency to make everything secret. One thing is to say a document is classified, but there are these other hybrid categories and new categories of sensitive but not classified. Uh, how extensive is that? Well, um, a study done by uh, the information sharing environment at the Office of the Director of National Intelligence found that there's over 103 labels that are not classification labels. They're things like sensitive but unclassified for official use only. And they're all different at every single agency. Um, that's a huge problem. And in fact, as a result of it, Congress directed and the President um, indeed directed the Director of National Intelligence to come up with a plan to resolve this. And the President issued a memo um, establishing a new category, yet another one <laughs> called controlled unclassified information. The problem with the President's plan is that while it does um, get rid of the 103 labels, it doesn't do anything to reduce the labeling of information. And you're going to end up exactly where you started if everyone is stamping everything with some sort of control label, because that's what stops the, the discussion and that's what stops the sharing of information. The other thing that happens with that kind of information is it's also what's used to retaliate against the whistleblowers. We have seen cases where whistleblowers, for example, air marshals, uh, lost their clearance and lost their jobs because they were sharing information that was not, in fact, classified, but was this pseudo-classification. So those whistleblowers are the most vulnerable because they have access to classified or this pseudo-classified information, and then they can lose their clearance 
and they don't have the, the due process to be able to fight back and say, I haven't done something wrong, it wasn't classified, and when they don't have their clearance, they can't do their job. Well, and when you're having massive overclassification and secrecy of the kind we've seen, um, there's not really a process within these kinds of investigations to look at whether it really is sensitive. So if someone is mislabeling it, that's it. That's going to make the decision. And the whistleblower who says, this is a problem, I have to talk to someone about it, is going to be harmed by going to talk to someone about it, even if there was nothing sensitive about the information. That's the danger of the overclassification. You have made some recommendations, Meredith, uh, to the Obama administration about what should be done on this front. You want to talk about that a little bit? Sure. I mean, we think there needs to be an overhaul of the classification system. And we think that the classification system has to build in some pressures against secrecy, um, including um, reducing the length of classification, erring on the side of not classifying when information is not really sensitive. But we also think there need to be internal checks on classification, and that means auditing, training, retraining, consequences for people who improperly wield the classification stamp, and protections for people who try to expose the overclassification. Danielle, there's another category of government information that's being kept secret, and that is a developed uh, contractor database. Can you tell us what that's about? Yes, well, uh, at, at POGO, we have been tracking for the last six years uh, federal contractors' records of misconduct because extraordinarily the government hasn't been keeping track. Uh, so that when a contracting officer is deciding whether a new government contract should go to a company, it's useful for them to know what the track record for that company has been. So we were very successful in finally having the Congress require the government create its own database with that information. But amazingly, uh, in the Senate, it was decided that that information should not be public. So yeah. it is only going to be held within the, the, uh, the government. That's extraordinary. <laughs> and, 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 and I wonder if there isn't some way to challenge that. Well, uh, our, our hope is we have certainly raised it uh, with the Obama uh, transition team that this is the kind of thing uh, that, in fact, he as a senator was including in legislation that he thought should be publicly available. So we're hoping that he will just advance it on his own and go beyond what the Congress was requiring. But if not, there's always the Freedom of Information Act, and it is not exempt from the FOIA, so we intend to get busy getting that information public. And I want to go back to that, Meredith, because you mentioned before that the way you were able to get behind some classifications is through filing Freedom of Information Act requests. I'm wondering if it's the same thing when it is sensitive but not classified. If in some ways there's a vehicle for public challenge when it is formally classified, but if it falls into one of these other categories, is it somehow even more concealed from public reach? Well, it is one of the things that's so bizarre about the law, because that's true. Um, if it's improperly classified, there are ways of challenging it. But if it's sensitive but unclassified, and that's inhibiting it being shared with the public, um, shared with other agencies that need to know it, there's not really any way of, of challenging it. And it's a real problem, because when, sometimes we're talking about what they call homeland security information, the kind of information that people need to know in their communities. We don't expect that our first preventers are going to be there all the time. Sometimes you just have to tell the town, this is a risk, and so that way the town can actually act on it. Those SBU labels prevent agencies from telling the town, including their local agencies, so it's really troubling. We'll be watching for early signs whether the Obama administration and Congress place a greater value in protecting national security agents' disclosures or enforcing the chain of command, regardless of the truth. And we'll also be looking to see if the era of overclassification is itself now coming to an end. Many thanks to Daniel Bryan and Meredith Fuchs for joining me. When we return, what the government knew about airport security before 9-11.
He led what was called the Red Team. This was a Federal Aviation Administration unit that conducted undercover tests on airport security before 9-11. What Bogdan Djokovic found were easy targets time and time again, but when he reported his findings up the chain of command all the way to the FAA administrator and to Congress, he was ignored and then exiled to a clerk's job to keep him out of the action. He didn't go quietly. Welcome, Bogdan, to Whistle Where You Work. Thank you. Bogdan, tell me a little bit about your background before you joined the Federal Aviation Administration. Um, I was born in Ohio, uh, but my parents came here from uh, Yugoslavia right after World War II. Uh, and I um, just grew up knowing that I was going to join the federal government because I thought it was a public service type uh, thing, you know. And uh, back in those days when my parents came here after World War II, um, the United States was viewed as the guiding light of the world. That's why people came here. And um, I just grew up feeling that, you know, government service and public service was the route I was going to take. And you went to the FAA in the late 80s? Right. And in 1995, you became a team leader on the Red Team, is that right. correct? Uh, tell us about what the Red Team was. Well, the Red Team started in 1990 uh, as a result of Pan Am 103, and Congress actually ordered FAA to establish a Red Team. And it had four basic rules that we operated by. The first was um, uh, that we reported directly to the, to the highest levels of FAA, which included uh, the administrator of FAA. My boss reported directly to the associate administrator for security. Uh, the other thing we, the other rule we went by was that we um, replicated the tactics that terrorists would use in the aviation environment. Uh, the third was that we would recommend, uh, find and recommend changes to security to enhance security. And fourth and most importantly, our job was to predict the next most likely terrorist attack so that we could take appropriate actions to prevent that attack. And how many different um, tests did you conduct uh, with the Red Team? Well, I, I'd have to think about that. Numerous. Uh, I mean, we submitted bombs through screening checkpoints, uh, bombs through... Um, I assume these weren't uh, real bombs. Right, they were dummy bombs, but they look like real bombs mm -hmm. uh, to the screeners anyway. And where were you doing this? All over. Both uh, in Europe and the U.S.? Uh, all over internationally. Mm -hmm. uh, we, um, we had to operate a little bit differently overseas mm -hmm. because we had to abide by the local country's laws and make sure we didn't get into trouble. But basically we operated anywhere that U.S. carriers flew to. Not everywhere, but most places. And give me an example of how the team might carry out its mission. Well, there are, there are a number of different kind of projects that we worked on. Uh, some of them were just literally just going to an airport and doing surveillance for several days and just monitoring security at different points uh, to see how effective it was. And nobody knew we were there. We would just go there, act like passengers, uh, very tedious, dull work. Um, but it was very important, you know, and um, at least I thought at the time. Uh, other programs we were involved in actually um, involved doing incursions on the runways uh, through uh, vehicle access gates and through passenger doors and stuff like this. Um, some of the times we had fairly realistic looking bombs that we would route through the system. And we just had to make sure that if we were caught, which was rare, um, that w we didn't get the rubber hose treatment from the police, you know, before they found out who we really were. Now, you say it was rare that you were caught. How right. often were you able actually to breach security? Um, it would fluctuate depending on what kind of work we're doing, but I'd say between um, 75 and 90% of the time we could breach security. However, uh, you have to keep in mind that we, we were actually trying to get caught. I mean, we were testing security based on the capabilities of who we were who the target was, but if we really wanted to get through security without getting caught, it would be close to 100%. In 1998, you authored a memo detailing uh, your findings about security and the successes of the Red Team. Um, who did you submit that to? 
I submitted it through most of my chain of command, but it, it was addressed to Jane Garvey, who was the head of uh, FAA at the time. And uh, she didn't do anything with the information. She didn't even have the courtesy to respond to the letter I sent her. And I also sent a copy to the Secretary of Transportation, who was Rodney Slater. And um, he at least had the courtesy to respond. And he directed or told the FAA that uh, you might want to look into these issues. And of course, there was no follow up. And this was August of 1998 uh, when both I and a number of other individuals that I was working with, um, we knew that a 9 11 attack type attack was going to occur as well, early as 98. Well, let's take a look at that. I mean, this was before 9 11. Um, and so there's reason to think that people weren't as security conscious back then as uh, they were subsequent uh, to 9 11. So, can you really, uh, were they really on? Um, uh, warned? Did, were they alerted that there might be the, uh, uh, some kind of terrorist attack using airport security as the hole in the system? I don't know if there was uh, an actual warning that said on such and such a date this exact thing is going to happen. But if you look at the history of terrorism, the recent history of terrorism, in 1995, um, a group of terrorists hijacked a French flag airplane out of Morocco, I think it was, and the French authorities discovered <coughs> that uh, the terrorists were going to hijack, were hijacking the plane with the intention of crashing it into downtown Paris. And uh, the pilot on the plane uh, convinced the terrorists that they didn't have enough fuel to get to Paris, so they landed in Marseille. And at that time, uh, the French commandos took over the plane and you know, they, they killed most of the hijackers. That was the first clue of the suicide nature of terrorism going from car bombs and body bombs to the aviation environment. The other thing was in 1994, there was an, a terrorist operation that has since been called Bojinka, which was an attempt by terrorists to blow up a dozen U.S. aircraft over the Pacific Ocean. And what happened in that situation is there was a fire in the apartment where they were making the bombs. And when the police showed up in the fire department, they found all this bomb-making material. And they also found a laptop computer that had the planes that they were going to bomb and when and who was going to bomb it and all this other stuff. So you combine the, just those two things right there, the suicide nature of extending into the aviation environment and the attempt to cause mass casualties, that should have been a major eye-opener to aviation security that we need to change how we do things. And of course, they, they ignored all this stuff. In but even, even aside from that, there were a lot of other smaller indicators mm -hmm. indicating that, that um, the face of terrorism was changing and was, the threat was getting worse. And they ignored it all. And then 9-11, of course, and everybody was focused now on the threat of terrorism and using uh, uh, hijacked airplanes as missiles, essentially, right. to uh, attack. Uh, about a month after 9-11, you filed a whistleblower disclosure. Uh, tell us about that. Um, af right after 9-11, I discovered, I was working at TSA, head or rather FAA headquarters at the time uh, as part of the red team. And I knew that there was going to be no effort to disclose or bring out these problems within the agency. So I figured the only way to bring this to change how we do business would be to file a whistleblower case, which I did, and that was in uh, late October of 2001. And uh, this was taken to the Office of Special Counsel, and what right. happened with it? Uh, it took them about a year to investigate my allegations, and um, uh, in February of 2002, they came out with their formal statement and their letter to the president. And it was a, a seven-page letter, if I remember right, and they basically agreed with all of my allegations, uh, uh, except for one, I think it was, which was a cover-up. Um, but uh, if I remember right, their exact quote was, FAA security executed its civil aviation mission in a manner that was a substantial and specific danger to public safety. Now that is a fairly damning statement from one bureaucracy to another. One would think. And, but nothing happened. I mean, they, they established TSA, but basically many of the managers that were responsible for thwarting security in FAA were promoted 
in TSA. And you, as the person who brought this information to the attention of the public, what happened to you? Uh, in February 2002, which is when uh, uh, the OSC came out with its statement, it also happened to be the same month that TSA officially took over operational control of security. And the very first week of TSA's existence, they took away all my job duties. And I literally had no work to do for an entire year. Um, what is the current state of airport security? Uh, I would say it's worse than it was before 9-11. And it, which is difficult to explain because before 9-11 we, we hardly had any security. I mean it was just window, it was total window dressing. But we didn't have 9-11 to convince us that we needed to do something else. Now we're throwing 20 or 30 times as much money into security, billions of dollars annually, and it's all window dressing. And only today I read a report from, sec it was a news article regarding Secretary Chertoff of DHS. And they are finally, seven, over seven years after 9-11, they're beginning to, to rethink how they do security. And they're adopting slowly some of the Israeli methods regarding profiling and stuff like this. And that's something that I advocated before 9-11. You know, you have to incorporate the human element in security if you really want to be effective. But the danger is, and there is a danger with this, is that the government may go overboard, and given the poor quality of TSA management and DHS, there is a sub substantial risk that civil rights and other issues like that are going to become a big problem. Well, let's take a, we only have a few seconds left. So I want to know about your rights um, and your thoughts on reflection. If you, knowing what happened to you and what impact your disclosures had or didn't have, uh, do you regret having um, filed your whistleblower uh, disclosure? Um, on a personal level, I do, because my life has been turned upside down. I mean, we virtually have no rights. The agency can treat you any way you want, any way they want. But on the other hand, I, the way I grew up, you know, I took an oath to defend this country and to abide by the Constitution. And I, I fulfilled that oath. So on the other hand, I'm very proud that I do it, and I would do it again. Well, many thanks to Bogdan Djokovic for sounding the alarm about bogus airport security. One thing is for sure, airline travel isn't what it used to be. Shoes off, empty those containers of water. Is this really about defending us from terrorism, or is it a system intended to make us afraid? If the TSA's concern is that terrorists might again turn a commercial flight into a missile, why not require airline manage manufacturers to install double holds to restrict access to the cockpit and the controls. Just a thought. I'm Mark Cohen, and this has been Whistle Where You Work. Mm -hmm.